Well, good morning. It is such a joy to hear those songs and worship to the truth of the lyrics. It's hard to believe that we're already in the month of October, almost to the halfway point of October. We've uh, moved from the summer into the fall, and uh, I hope your family is doing well with the new season. Our family, this new season for us, actually represents kind of a milestone. 24 days ago, my oldest daughter Ashley and her husband Jordan welcomed a beautiful baby girl into the world. Her name was Bailey Joy, and that means that 24 days ago, I officially became a grandpa. Thank you. When my daughter told us that she was expecting, I looked at my wife and I said, honey, you are way too young to be a grandma. And then she looked at me and said, dear, you've kind of always been a grandpa. <laughs> so I embrace that and uh, I'm only three and a half weeks in, but so far it's been great. I highly recommend it. Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and take them and turn to Mark chapter 14, verses 32 to 42. Mark chapter 14, verses 32 to 42. In keeping with our theme on prayer this month, I've been asked to address the account of our Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane, and that's found in this passage in Mark chapter 14. It was June 18th, 1940, that a relatively new Prime Minister of Britain stood before the House of Commons, and he delivered the third in a series of three speeches that would come to define his legacy. Just a few weeks before that, the British Army had been embarrassed at Dunkirk by German forces in a rescue operation that was both heroic and a bit humiliating. The British army fled from northern France back home to Britain. About a week after that, this prime minister delivered a fiery speech, a very defensive but also strong declaration of Britain's resolve. He said, we will never surrender. And yet the situation grew worse. Things looked very grim. In fact, on June 16th, just two days before he would deliver this third speech, French resistance finally fell, and French leadership requested an armistice from the Germans, which resulted in Nazi occupation of France. So, with the British army back home, bruised and battered, and with France now under German control, Winston Churchill, on June 18, 1940, stood before the House of Commons, and he delivered a speech in which he famously acknowledged that given the circumstances, this was the darkest hour. The darkest hour for France, the darkest hour for the Western world. Well, in an infinitely greater sense, our text this morning, the account of our Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane, it describes for us the darkest hour in our Lord's ministry, the darkest hour in redemptive history. This is the darkest hour. It's dark because the darkness of the shadow of the cross looms large in the garden. The darkness of the cup of God's wrath. Christ stands on the precipice of punishment as He looks forward to the cross. The darkness of the dismal display of the disciples, these faint-hearted and feeble followers of Jesus, is on display. The darkness of human wickedness that mankind, the enemies of Christ, would kill the very Son of God and the Savior of the world. The darkness of the armies and forces of hell all arrayed against our Savior. 
This is indeed a dark hour. And yet, it is against the backdrop of that darkness that the perfect and unchanging character of our Lord shines brilliantly, and the radiance and beauty of our redemption is put on vivid display. Scientists tell us that diamonds are formed deep in the darkness of the earth's crust, that they're formed under intense pressure, 50,000 times the pressure of the surface, formed under intense heat, 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And there's a sense in which this passage, I believe, presents for us the diamond of divine deliverance. The diamond of divine deliverance, because there is in this text intense pressure, excruciating pressure. And again, our Lord is perfect and unchanging and immutable, and the glory of His character shines forth even as He is tested, such that the result is that our redemption, the glory of it, the beauty of it, the magnificence of it, is put on incredible display. And so we have the darkest hour, and yet at the same time, the radiance of our redemption, and specifically of our Redeemer. In keeping with that theme, we're going to look at this text under six headings. I'm calling them six facets of this astonishing account. Six facets of this astonishing account in the Garden of Gethsemane. The first of those six facets is found in verse 32, and I'm calling it simply the gathering in the garden. The gathering in the garden, Mark chapter 14, verse 32. They came to a place named Gethsemane, and He said to His disciples, sit here until I have prayed. Now, the name Gethsemane means oil press or olive press. That makes the Garden of Gethsemane the original olive garden. (laughs) But in all seriousness, it is an appropriate name because it is in this garden where our Lord will be pressed. He will be tested. And it's here at the Garden of the Olive Press, then on the slopes of the Mount of Olives, that Jesus and the eleven arrive, having come from the upper room. Let's consider what they have already experienced. In John 13, they're in the upper room. Jesus washes His disciples' feet. Judas is exposed as the traitor and leaves into the darkness. And then the eleven who remain celebrate with our Lord the final Passover. And they also simultaneously celebrate the first Lord's Supper. And they partake of the bread which symbolizes His body offered for them. And they drink of the cup which symbolizes His blood shed for them. And then John 14, he tells them that he's about to leave them, and they want to know where he's going. He promises to prepare a place for them, and he promises that the Helper will come, the Holy Spirit. And when we get to the end of chapter 14, they get up and leave the upper room, and they start to make their way from the upper room through Jerusalem. I think in John 15, they're walking by vineyards in Jerusalem when Jesus says to His disciples, I am the vine and you are the branches. And at the end of chapter 15, He tells them that if the world hates you, know that the world hated me first. And John 16, that they will be persecuted. And at the end of chapter 16, they assure Him that 
Even though he has told them in the middle of John 16 that he must die and yet he will rise again, they, they assure him that even if he is attacked by his enemies, they will never fall away. We see that even in our passage in Mark 14, that they tell Jesus, Peter most of all, that they will never fall away. And then John 17, a passage that, Lord willing, Josiah Grauman will preach for us next Sunday, known as the High Priestly Prayer of Christ, the Lord prays for His disciples And they hear him pray for their protection. And he prays that he would be glorified by the Father even in his darkest hour. And then John 18, verse 1, they cross cross the Kidron Valley and they come up the lower slopes of the Mount of Olives and they enter into this garden, the Garden of the Olive Press. It was likely likely a private walled garden. It was seemingly familiar to Jesus and His disciples. Luke in Luke 22 says it was His custom, Jesus' custom, to come and pray on the Mount of Olives. And it must have been a familiar place because Judas knew right where to go. And of course, the Mount of Olives has eschatological significance because although this is our Lord's darkest hour, when He returns, He will return and He will set His feet on the Mount of Olives, this place. But that is yet future. And the Lord comes to this garden knowing that this is His hour of testing. This is His darkest hour, and He tells His disciples, you sit here. I am going to pray. Well, that brings us to a second facet of this astonishing account The gathering in the garden, verse 32. Secondly, what I'm calling the agony of anticipation, verses 33 and 34. The agony of anticipation. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be very distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. Our Lord takes His three closest disciples, Peter, James, and John, and they go farther into the garden. It was Peter and James and John who were with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. That's recorded in Mark chapter 9, verses 1 to 11. They witnessed His heavenly glory, the unveiling of His glory. And now, They will witness the depths of His humiliation as they hear Him praying to the Father. And as our Lord anticipates all that He will endure in the upcoming hours, you can see Mark explaining that His soul is troubled. He is deeply distressed, a word in The New Testament that only occurs in the Gospel of Mark, it occurs four times in the Gospel of Mark. The other three times it's translated as amazed because it has to do with almost the astonishment of being suddenly struck with the reality of one's circumstances. And he's very sorrowful. His soul is sorrowful even to the point of death. His heart is troubled. And it might be easy for us to think about all that we know of what will take place next in terms of the cross and to think that the Lord is only distressed because He's thinking about the physical side of what it means to suffer torture and an excruciating death on a cross. But I would suggest that what is far more weighty in our Lord's heart in this moment is the reality of what it means to drink the cup of God's wrath as the bearer of man's sin, such that He would pay the punishment of the sins and for the sins of all who would believe in Him. It is the reality of knowing that He will be abandoned by the Father, 
such that in Mark chapter 15, verse 34, he will cry out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And as he stands on the precipice of that reality, he is overwhelmed in terms of the deep distress that he feels in his heart. But as we will see, he is not overcome. Our Lord, of course, because he knew all things, knew all that he would suffer. He has the full knowledge of what he is about to endure. He certainly remembered the words of Isaiah 53, which prophesied of the suffering servant that he would be smitten, stricken, afflicted, bruised, beaten, oppressed, crushed, cut off from the land of the living, led as a lamb to the slaughter. And worst of all, hardest of all, Isaiah 53, 10, the Father would be pleased to crush him. And so, he instructs Peter and James and John to keep watch and to pray because this is our Lord's darkest hour. Well, there's a third facet here in this astonishing account. The gathering at the garden, verse 32, the agony of anticipation, verses 33 and 34, now verses 35 and 36, the price of punishment. The price of punishment. And He went a little further, a little beyond them into the garden, and our Lord fell to the ground And he began to pray that if it were possible, that the hour might pass him by. And he was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet, not what I will, but what you will. We're going to come back a little later in this message and address specifically verse 36, but there are three things that I want you to consider as we think about these verses and the price of the punishment that was paid, the cost of the cup, the requirement of redemption. First, consider the price. Consider the price. The price that our Lord paid was greater than any price that any sinner has ever paid or will ever pay because the price that our Lord paid was the cumulative weight of all of the sins of all who would believe on Him. And not only that, but our perfect sinless Lord accomplished something in His sacrifice that not even hell can accomplish. The Lord Jesus satisfied the wrath and justice of God. He paid the price in full. Hell never satisfies God's wrath, which is why hell is eternal. But what the eternal Son of God did on the cross is He satisfied God's wrath He accomplished what not even hell can accomplish. But he literally had to go through hell to accomplish it. So consider the cost. Consider the price. Our Lord considered it as he fell on the ground and cried out to his Father in those moments in the garden. Secondly, consider the possibility. Consider the possibility. Our our Lord, verse 35, if it were possible, if it's possible, might this hour pass me by? And even in His prayer, Father, all things are possible for You. Does this not elevate and heighten and deepen our appreciation for what it was that was won for us at the cross? Because the reality is, if there were another way, certainly the Father would have granted His Son's request. 
And yet what this text teaches us is that there was no other way. There is no plan B. There is no second option. There is no other possible path. There is only one way that redemption can be accomplished, and it is through the death of the sacrificial substitute on behalf of sinners. This is why there is no other name under heaven by which we may be saved. Because the only way is through the one who just hours before this told his disciples, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And then consider not just the price and the possibility, but consider the purpose Certainly our Lord was considering the weightiness and the gravity of all of these things as He cried out to His Father. In the 11th century, there was a Christian author named Anselm of Canterbury who wrote a book called Why God Became Man. And in that book, he correctly asserts that because of sin, mankind had a debt that they owed to God, a debt that only humanity is obligated to pay. And yet, because it is an infinite debt, only God is able to pay it. So man has all of the responsibility and God all of the ability. And so God the Son took on flesh and became a man so that as a man he might pay what men owed And he could do it because he is God. And so when we come to a text like this, it causes us to consider the price of our redemption, a great price, an infinite price, an incomprehensible price. And an exclusive price an exclusive reality that can only be accomplished this way by this one. And he did it because we who were incapable could not save ourselves. Do you see the man of sorrows in the garden? Do you see your Savior on the ground, on his knees, on his face, pleading with his Father, considering the cost of the cup of divine wrath that he is about to drink, and sweating as it were, Luke tells us, drops of blood? The price of the punishment. This is his darkest hour. That brings us to a fourth facet in this text. A fourth facet, what I would call the weariness of the weak. The weariness of the weak. Verses 37 to 40. And Jesus came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for an hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not fall into temptation, for the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. Well, what a contrast we see between our Lord praying fervently in verses 35 and 36 and His followers sleeping in verses 37 to 40. Now, Luke 22 does help us a little bit because He tells us that the disciples were weary from their sorrow. So, there was sorrow behind their sleepiness. And yet at the same time, this illustrates their utter weakness. We have a class here at the seminary called the Pastor and Prayer. And in the pastoral prayer class, our students are required as part of their assignment to pray for an hour a day. How many of them find themselves in this verse? Could you not stay awake for even an hour? Some of you this morning find yourself in that verse. Your eyes are heavy. 
Now, both Matthew and Mark tell us that Jesus came back to the disciples on three occasions, which means that He entered into intense hours of prayer three times, likely one hour each time for a total of three hours of intense prayer. The question is, why three times? I think there may be some connection in this text to the fact that at the end of Mark chapter 14, Peter is going to deny Christ three times. Right in the passage right before this, Peter and the others, they assure the Lord that they will never fall away, and yet they will all fall away, but before they fall away, they fall asleep. So there's some potential foreshadowing there. I think more than that, this threefold prayer session of our Lord represents a bookend on His earthly ministry, because His earthly ministry, beginning with His baptism, immediately ushered Him into the wilderness where He was tested three times by the devil. And now, here at the end of His ministry, He is tested three times. Not only that, but there may be some connection to the fact that on the cross, According to Mark 15, verses 33 and 34, there will be three hours of darkness. The depth of the period of time when our Lord is suffering the cup of God's wrath, three hours of darkness on the cross, three hours of prayer in the garden. But the main point I want you to see in these verses is the weakness of the disciples, because the disciples reflect us, right? It's one thing to look at the disciples and be like, I can't believe you guys can't even stay awake in this moment. Do you not realize what is happening? And yet the weakness of the disciples that is displayed on this occasion, is it not representative of all? all of the followers of the Lord Jesus, because we are all feeble and faint-hearted and frail and fragile. We're weak. And does it not also elevate the magnificence of what Christ will do on the cross because He is staring into the cup of divine wrath recognizing what it will cost to accomplish redemption and He's going to do it for these sleeping disciples and other weak and incapable people like us. Not many wise, not many noble, not many strong. And yet, our Lord will accomplish the divine plan of redemption, and He will do it, as Titus chapter 2 says, to redeem for Himself a people for His own possession, zealous for good works. This is our Lord's darkest hour, and His closest friends cannot even stay awake. Well, that brings us to a fifth facet. We have the gathering in the garden, verse 32, the agony of anticipation, 33 and 34, the price of punishment, verses 35 and 36, the weariness of the weak, verses 37 to 40, and now the sacrifice of the substitute, verses 41 and 42, the sacrifice of the substitute. And He came the third time, verse 41, and He said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. Our Lord comes back to the disciples this third time. He finds them still sleeping. They are utterly unprepared for this moment. But our Lord is fully prepared fully prepared. He knows exactly what is going to happen next. He's going to be betrayed by Judas. He's going to be falsely accused by the religious leaders. 
He's going to be wrongly sentenced by Pilate. He's going to be severely mistreated by the soldiers. And he's going to be hung on a cross between two criminals. But we should not think for a moment that our Lord is a victim. He is the victorious Savior even in this moment. He is not helpless. He could summon a legion of angels at any point. He is in control of every aspect of what is happening. He is accomplishing the divine plan of redemption. Emerging from the garden, He sets His face to the cross, and He moves forward with deliberate determination and absolute resolve so that when He says to His disciples, get up, let's go, He's not defeated, He's determined. And He will march to the cross to accomplish what He came to accomplish because His hour has come. And all throughout His ministry, how many times in the Gospels do we read about His enemies trying to get to Him, trying to attack Him, and the text repeatedly reminds us that His hour had not yet come, but now, here in the garden, His hour has come. And it is the hour of darkness, His darkest hour. And yet our Lord will rise to meet the moment because this is His moment. It is the hour for which He came into the world. And though the darkness is dark, it will not overcome Him because He is the light of the world and the darkness cannot overcome it. Well, that brings us to a sixth and final facet of this astonishing account. The gathering in the garden, the agony of anticipation, the price of punishment, the weariness of the weak, the sacrifice, the intentional, purposeful sacrifice of a substitute who said, I'm willing to give myself to be ransomed. I'm willing to give my life as a ransom. I'm willing to give myself as the substitute No one took Jesus' life from him. He gave it willingly. A sixth facet of this astonishing account. And perhaps you're wondering, wait a second, we ran out of text. How can there be another point? But it is a summary point. The majesty of this moment. The majesty of this moment. And I want to express to you the majesty of this moment in two ways, and I will confess that this text is bigger than me. It's bigger than any of us. This is the apex of redemptive history. There's a sense in which this text is holy ground. The majesty of this moment seen in two ways. First, in the context of redemptive history, in the context of redemptive history. You see, this is not the first important event in redemptive history to take place in a garden. It's no coincidence that Christ prays in a garden. Because what else happened in a garden? Mankind was created and placed in a garden. And if you were to look at Genesis chapter 3, you don't have to turn there, but if you were to look at Genesis chapter 3, you would see that the very components that are here in Mark 14 are also in that chapter where the fall of man is described. Because what do we have in Genesis 3 verses 1 to 6? We have a gathering in a garden of Adam and Eve and a serpent who tempts them. And we have disobedience and sin and a failure and a fall. And then in verses 7 through 10 of Genesis chapter 3, we have the agony of anticipation as Adam and Eve hide themselves and try and clothe themselves with fig leaves, and they're afraid because they hear the voice of God in the garden. And then in verses 11 to 19, we have the price of punishment where God says, because you have done what you were not supposed to do, cursed is the earth, and cursed is the serpent, and the woman, and the man. 
Because in the day that you eat of that tree, you will surely die. And then in verses 22 to 24 of that chapter, Genesis chapter 3, we see the weariness of the weak as Adam and Eve are cast out of the garden and as they begin to try and etch an existence on the edge of Eden, having been cast out. And the rest of biblical history are human beings looking for a deliverer to deliver them from the weariness and weakness of living in this sin-cursed life. And yet there is also the sacrifice of a substitute seen in Genesis 3. The promise of that substitute in Genesis 3.15, that the seed of the woman will come. And though the serpent will bite him on the heel, the seed the Savior will crush the serpent on the head. And verse 21, the picture of that, God killed an animal in the garden, almost certainly a lamb. And He clothed Adam and Eve in the skins of that animal. And so you have the sacrifice of a substitute promised and pictured in Genesis 3. But think about this. What happened in the Garden of Eden was undone in the Garden of Gethsemane. Where the first Adam was tested and fell, the second Adam was tested and triumphed. Where the first Adam lost everything, the second Adam recovered everything. The first Adam forfeited it all by eating from a tree. The second Adam will recover it all by dying on a tree. The first Adam could never repay the debt that he incurred. The second Adam paid it in full. The first Adam could only anticipate redemption. The second Adam accomplished redemption. Gethsemane is the restoration of all that went wrong in Eden. Well, there's a second aspect in which I want you to understand the majesty of this moment, and it's in verse 36. We went past verse 36 very quickly in our survey of this text. I want to come back to it as our conclusion because verse 36, I've used the metaphor of a diamond. To take that metaphor just a little bit further, verse 36 is the crown jewel of this text. And it is our Lord's prayer, our Lord's prayer to His Father as He bowed with His head to the ground. And what I want you to see is I want you to see four features of this prayer. We might call them four perfections of this crown jewel here in the garden against the blackness and darkness of Christ's darkest hour. And he was saying, Abba, Father. The first feature of our Lord's prayer is perfect relationship. Perfect relationship. When you read these words, Abba, Father, You have to understand that you don't understand. You have to recognize that when our Lord entreats His Father in this way with terms of affection and intimacy and endearment, He is entreating the one with whom He has had perfect and uninterrupted fellowship from all eternity past. And He he approaches his father on the brink of the cross, knowing that in just a few hours he will be abandoned by the father in a way that is inexplicable, such that he will cry out on the cross, why have you forsaken me? And yet here in the garden, it is Abba, Father, perfect relationship. Secondly, perfect reliance. All things are possible for you. Perfect reliance. 
In his earthly ministry, our Lord was always perfectly submissive to the will of the Father. He entrusted himself into the hands of the Father in everything. He never did anything that was outside of the will of the Father. He was always in perfect obedience to the Father, always totally and wholly dependent on the Father. And please understand, this text is no exception. He continues to be perfectly perfectly entrusted to his heavenly Father, recognizing that his Father is sovereign over all things and has the power to accomplish anything. Perfect reliance. And then a third feature, a third perfection, perfect righteousness, perfect righteousness. Here we have the request that our Lord makes, remove this cup from me. What is the cup? The cup is God's wrath. It is the reality of the wrath of God that should have been aimed at all of us, but was absorbed by the Son to accomplish the redemption of His chosen people. But what I want you to understand, and the reason I call it perfect righteousness, is because I think sometimes this text is presented as if our Lord is somehow resistant to the will of God, or that He wants something different than what the Father wants, and nothing could be further from the truth. This is not a resistant attitude. This instead is a realistic assessment of what it means to suffer for sin, and a righteous aversion as one who has never sinned, perfect and pure, spotless, eternally righteous, holy of holies reacting to the reality that he will be treated on the cross as if he were a sinner. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he who knew no sin will be made sin, meaning a sin offering, so that we might, being clothed in his righteousness, become the righteousness of God in him. This is a righteous recoiling, a holy aversion. This is not unwillingness. This is holiness. And then a fourth facet of this prayer, perfect resolve, perfect resolve. Immediately, our Lord expresses along with His request, yet not what I will, but what you will. Again, our Lord never waffled, never wavered, never wanted something that the Father didn't want. And it's clear in this text because He tells us, I want to do the will of the one who sent me. In fact, He has just finished telling the disciples in His high priestly prayer, I and the Father are one, John 17, 30. As he said all the way back in John 4, my bread is to do the will of the one who sent me. There's no daylight between the will of the Son and the will of the Father. They are in perfect accord and perfect alignment. And although this text, and I think rightly so, gives us an example of how Christ's human will was submitted to the divine will, I think the main point here is that Christ emerges from this prayer with steadfast commitment to that which he was always committed to do, to obey and to submit and to accomplish the plan of redemption that the triune God had established in eternity past. And really what I'm trying to communicate is that this prayer of Christ in verse 36 is not a prayer of weakness. The man of sorrows, this is his darkest hour, yes, but this is not a moment of weakness. This is a moment of strength because he's being tested 
And in the testing, his perfect, unchanging, immutable character and his perfect, unchanging, immutable commitment to accomplish the will of God and to finish the plan of redemption, it shines forth in the testing. It is brilliant and beautiful, and it radiates from this text. The man of sorrows is not weak. He is strong. And what a glorious thing that is, because the price is a price that only He can pay. There is no other possible way. If the Son of God had not come, we would be like the demons, with no hope, no one to help us, and no future but hell. So do you see the man of sorrows in the garden in his darkest hour? Because he has overcome the darkness such that his darkest hour is in actuality a moment of victory, not a moment of defeat. June 18th, 1940, Winston Churchill gave that speech in which he described the events that had taken place in Europe as a darkest hour. But what's interesting is that he actually concluded that speech not on a pessimistic note, but an optimistic one. He was convinced that Britain and her allies had the resolve to resist, and that one day Britain and her allies would emerge victorious. And so he actually ends that speech by talking about how that day would be their finest hour. In fact, if you were to look up that speech, it's actually called their finest hour. Here in the Garden of Gethsemane, we have the darkest hour in all of redemptive history. But I think you would agree with me that it is also simultaneously the finest hour, because as he sets his face to the cross, what happens in a garden culminates at Calvary, but it doesn't end there, because three days later, our Savior arose from the dead, and having defeated Satan, sin, and death, he is now seated at the right hand of the Father. And one day, all who are in Christ will see Him face to face. And for all of eternity, we will join the multitudes in heaven singing the words of Revelation 4 and 5. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Heavenly Father, thank You for the truth of this text. I confess that this text It's so much bigger than what I could possibly communicate. Because here we see God the Son, the Son of Man, in His moment of testing, demonstrating such victory, victory that culminates in the cross, so that those who believe in Him can be forgiven because He paid our penalty. And those who believe in Him can be declared righteous because like Adam and Eve, we're clothed in the righteousness of our substitute. May this prayer cause us to worship. It's not so much a model for us to emulate as it is a marvel for us to contemplate, to commemorate, and to celebrate. And we do look forward to the day when we will see our Savior face to face. And so we pray these things in His name.